Well, welcome everybody to our interview with the experts. Today, we have the distinct pleasure of welcoming an expert in the field of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who will be no stranger to most of our audience, Dr. Steve Allman. He's the director of the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Clinic at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And he is uh, also the distinguished chair of the writing committee for the 2020 uh, Car Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy guidelines, which were released last December. And we were just commenting how they're almost a year old at this point in time, but there are still some changes uh, from the 2011 guidelines that we wanted to highlight for this audience. So Steve, maybe you could give us just a little update on what you think are the major changes and how clinicians and patients should be thinking about these guidelines as we move forward. Yeah, Kyle, thanks so much for the opportunity to, to be here today. Uh, you know, I would say that the 2020 guidelines are, are largely an evolution of, you know, of what's occurred in the management of HCM over the years from the 2011 guidelines, the 2015 European Society of Cardiology guidelines, and now in 2020. But a few of the key points that, that were clarified or re-clarified in, in that document are one, is the importance of uh, allowing patients to participate in decisions regarding their care uh, and options available to them. It's not a new concept. Many people have been practicing that way for years, but making it explicit where um, uh, perhaps inadvertently a lot of dogmatic practices uh, had been put in place and, and, and allowing patients to understand the, the risks and benefits of, of various options to them and, and, and participate in that decision, the concept of shared decision making. The other thing was that the first time in any of the guidelines documents, we really advocated for the role of comprehensive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy centers and where they really provide the most benefit for patients, as well as calling out where cardiologists working outside of those centers have a role in diagnosis and therapy, advancing therapies, et cetera. And it's important for a condition like HCM, where some of the procedures are so specific to patients with that, and we now have data that, that identifies that uh, outcomes are, are magnitudes of order better uh, when it's done by experienced uh, clinicians, surgeons, proceduralists, that, that those, that's when patients really should be given the opportunity to, to take advantage of the centers that do exist. I think a couple of the other things that, that uh, I would point out are, are one, uh, we clarified uh, some screening, particularly around uh, screening of children, adolescents and younger, and, and when that, that should be done. Um, the risk stratification for sudden cardiac death certainly evolved, and I think that we arrived at a way that blends uh, the use of risk markers, which are highly sensitive markers for identifying anyone at risk for HCM, and then using the validated uh, sudden cardiac death risk calculator, not as a way to make the decision, but rather as a communication tool to help patients understand the magnitude of their risk if they're thinking about whether or not to get an ICD placed. Um, the, the, the use of septal reduction therapies was largely unchanged uh, compared to prior guidelines although there are some emerging indications for patients who maybe don't have as advanced symptoms, class three symptoms, but are having highly symptomatic paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, or they have severe mitral regurgitation, or, or beginning to have pulmonary hypertension, that maybe you can start entertaining those, that, you know, surgical myectomy sooner in their course. And then lastly, we put some new language in around uh, healthy lifestyles, exercise, and again, uh, thorough discussions of risks and benefits for those patients who happen to be competitive athletes uh, as data continue to emerge in that area. So a lot of broad areas uh, were, were spruced up, re-clarified some of the language, um, and, and, and we had a great team that worked on the guidelines. The writing committee was great to work with, and, and I think we uh, We've advanced the field uh, in terms of getting it up to speed of, of what we're practicing at some of the major HCM centers. And I know that it was a huge undertaking. I mean, these guidelines are incredibly helpful and very well written. And I, you know, my kudos to you and your team for really coming up with such a wonderful 
document that we can refer to. And I'd also like to point out that the ACC does have an app that you can access these guidelines, actually the ACC and the AHA, and the guidelines are available on both these apps. And I found that really helpful to use in clinic at times because there's a lot of nuances that sometimes you may want to rip back and refer to. But is I would like to take maybe a few minutes just to clarify. I mean, you did a great overview of what things we need to pay attention to and what's changed and what's stayed the same. But maybe, um, you know, the shared decision making, I think that that's a really important point, And we never really addressed that in the 2011 guidelines. And I think in my practice as a cardiomyopathy uh, a clinician, I tend to use that a lot around the ICD mm -hmm. uh, placement because there's still a lot of uncertainty. And, and maybe we could talk a little bit about the calculator mm -hmm. and how that was incorporated uh, and how that can be used to help with the shared decision making. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's a it's a really great point, and 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 being specific with examples probably helps with this. So, if I think about a patient that I saw recently uh, who had um, non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, so just the fact that that individual has that finding means that he has higher risk for sudden cardiac death than if he didn't have non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. And historically, that has been, uh, for adult patients, a class 2B indication for an ICD. So not a super strong indication, but essentially means he's eligible for one. Mm -hmm. and, and so then you could talk to the patient about the pros and cons of a defibrillator. But the calculator helps put a finer point on it. So this individual, when I enter his number into that calculator, I can say you have this, you are eligible for a defibrillator and your risk for sudden cardiac death in the next five years is between five and 6% based on the calculations that we have that includes his age and his wall thickness and several other parameters, as you know. That's, that's something that a patient can easily get their brain around. Okay, now I understand. You're saying that in the next five years, there's a 5% chance that I, that I might die from this. That's, that's more tangible than the patient than me simply saying, you've got high risk and it's kind of a, a, a wishy-washy uh, strength of recommendation for the patient. The patient can get that. Yeah, I agree. I, I, and that's another app, by the way. You can download that calculator onto a device, a phone, a smartphone. Yeah. And, yeah. and actually sit in the room with the patient and calculate their risk. Yeah. I think the one thing that I do find a little interesting is um, at Mayo Clinic in Rochester and actually across the enterprise, we tend to use LA volumes and the calculator was based on the uh, LA dimension. Yeah. Which is one of the things that I usually have to measure online when I'm sitting with the patients, but I think it's a very, very helpful tool um, and uh, would, would yeah. encourage everyone to take a look at that closely. Yeah, and, and and I think you can you can use some you know rough guidelines. I mean, if the LA volumes on the echocardiogram show a you know very severely enlarged left atrium, well, then you're going to put a, a big LA diameter in there for that calculator. It will influence that score, but it doesn't change it by you know three, four, five percent uh, if you're putting the LA. Right size into kind of a mild, moderate, severe type category, and you just convert that. And, and one of our colleagues uh, is working on some uh, algorithms that would convert the LA volume into a, a, a into a imputable LA diameter. So yeah, for any patient that might be listening to this nuanced discussion between Steve and I, who are we're both people that spend a lot of our time looking at echocardiograms. So uh, this would be more of a nuanced discussion for uh, clinicians rather than patients. But I think what it points out is that a lot of these uh, parameters are based on large uh, databases and statistical analysis of those databases and LA volume was one of the things that probably reflects the stiffness of the left ventricle yeah. when we think about yeah. it. Um, that, thank you, Steve. Then um, one other thing that when we look at the sudden, risk, the sudden, uh, the sudden cardiac death risk factors, um, maybe I just ask you to point out what those tend to be now. And, and there was one that dropped off the list and maybe we can come back to that uh, yeah. being the blood pressure that falls with exercise. So what are the current risk factors that, that we think about when we're thinking about sudden cardiac death? Yeah, so, so, so the main things that we think at in terms of just identifying risk factors are uh, maximum left ventricular wall thickness, 
um, if it exceeds 30 millimeters, that has been kind of in the past identified as a risk marker. The calculator incorporates it as a continuous variable, which is appropriate uh, because the, because the risk isn't a step function at 30. It's like curve a linear relationship with 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 the risk. Um, syncope that is likely or probably arrhythmic in nature not vasovagal syncope, but syncope that when you take the history, uh, talk to those around the person, it, it sounds like it could be arrhythmia related. Uh, and family history of sudden cardiac death uh, in, in a first degree relative are, are super important. This year, we added um, LV apical aneurysm. So this is a this is a true aneurysm, not not just a little area of maybe non-convergence at the apex, but you know truly scarred, dilated, akinetic uh, uh, aneurysm, and it makes sense because that represents arrhythmia substrate. The border zone between the scar and non-scarred area is where ventricular arrhythmias can arise. Mm -hmm. And a, and a low ejection fraction, as, as you know, HCM patients often have a higher than normal calculated ejection fraction because their cavity is so small. So if their EF is less than 50%, there are now data that show that there are worse outcomes. Then the, then the next tier down of risk factors include non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. It's much more important in children uh, statistically than it is in adults. And then... Uh, Extensive myocardial fibrosis is demonstrated with CMR imaging, like gadolinium enhancement. If it's more than 15 to 20 percent of the LV mass is replaced by scar, then that's one of the risk markers that is, that is also considered there. Yeah, I think that's that's great um, to just highlight those things. And one of the ones that we used to look for quite frequently when you know, the uh, screening was, you know, before the 2020 guidelines was a drop in blood pressure with exercise. And I, I uh, was wondering if you might just address that one is not on the list anymore. It was always a, a weaker one, but on the other yeah. hand. Yeah, it, 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 kind of, it kind of got, you know, slid down a little bit in 2011 even, and then it wasn't really addressed in the ESC guidelines. They didn't, they didn't mention it much in 2015 as well. And, and the issue is that while there are some data that, that show it, it, it supported in, in multivariable analyses, that was one of the ones that was not as often independently associated with sudden cardiac death as others. Plus there's just the technical vagaries of, of trying to do that where, you, where you've got someone, a, a nurse or an exercise technician taking a blood pressure on someone who's trying to run the treadmill and, and how reliable is that? Uh, and, and is that blood pressure drop related to an increasing outflow tract gradient that's occurring with exercise and not due to some sort of autonomic dysfunction that's causing a vasodilatory response in the patient. So just all those complicating factors, uh, we felt like the, the newer emerging risk markers were much more easy to, easier to ascertain and to interpret uh, for patients. Yeah, that's, I think that's a really important point that it's not like we're ignoring a drop in blood pressure. It's just that it's not as important in terms of a defibrillator decision. Uh, right. Certainly, as clinicians, we would take a drop in blood pressure with exercise in a patient that might have either autonomic dysfunction or increasing outflow tract obstruction as being informative about what might be causing some of their symptoms. So that's, right. that's great uh, clarification. Um, I wondered, you mentioned the ESC guidelines, the European Society of Cardiology uh, guidelines, which were published in 2015. Mm -hmm. Were there any areas uh, that you would consider be a discrepancy or that we covered that they didn't or vice versa that you think our audience should be aware of? No, the, 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 main, the main difference with the ESC guidelines was around the sudden cardiac death risk assessment and eligibility for ICD. So in their document in 2015, they relied heavily on the calculator and using pre-specified levels of risk, five-year risk, to identify eligibility for ICDs. When you talk to the committee members who did that, they said that was one of the more controversial discussions they had because they recognized that they were making a decision as a committee and it was actually the opposite of doing shared decision making where the patient gets to express their level of risk tolerance. So if we go back to that patient I shared before, some patients will be scared by a 5% chance of sudden death in the next five years. Others will be reassured by that. They'll hear a 5% risk as a 95% chance of it not happening, and I'm okay with that. And so we tried to decouple the actual decision 
from the risk and use the risk as a communication tool to help put it in context for the patient as they got to express their concerns. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic way of looking at it. And, you know, it's certainly a, a, a 25 year old looking at a 5% in five years seems, you know, that that's going to be additive over a lifetime. Whereas an 85 year old might say, well, you know, at my age, and then we also know the risk of sudden cardiac death does go down a little bit from the actual underlying pathophysiology of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with age. So I think there's a, that, that's a very nice way that the committee chose to frame that uh, discussion. Um, the other uh, thing that you highlighted as a change, and I think that the sensor are gonna be both patients and cardiologists on this, uh, listening to this podcast, it might be interesting to just explore a little bit further what you meant by comprehensive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy centers and how we blend that with care for a cardiologist that may be um, in a, in a non considered a non-comprehensive care and how the committee thought about that. Because at first blush, maybe a cardiologist would feel a little offended, like I'm not able to take care of cardiomyopathy patients. But in the, in the grand scheme of things, we're actually saying this is really a partnership between cardiology teams. And that's kind of what we're looking for. And I think that's worthwhile exploring with this audience. Yeah, that's that's exactly right, Kyle. So so the idea is is we're not advocating that centers take over all of the care for a patient with HCM, but rather where where do patients benefit most from getting the expertise from those centers? And and what should non-center-based cardiologists know and feel confident that, that they can do? And so we tried to define that based on competencies that might exist at a center. Uh, and targeted, you know, uh, metrics for what defines success based on what is achievable when high volumes are done. And so, and so, some of it just is, you know, if, if you if you happen to be a cardiologist uh, at a at a regional medical center, but you don't have uh, uh, super strong surgical uh, myectomy or, or cardiac yeah. surgery program at all in some cases, or uh, you know, intense electrophysiology available to you at your center or genetics available to you, those kind of things, then, then it's hard to be a comprehensive center in that regard. But certainly any cardiologist uh, seeing a patient with HCM can do the initial diagnostic workup with echo ECG, ambulatory ECG monitoring, uh, plus or minus MRI if there's diagnostic or risk, uh, you know, considerations there. All, all those things can be attained by the, by the cardiologist. And if a patient is symptomatic, first-line therapies in the form of beta blockers or, or you know, verapamil or diltiazem might be initiated by those cardiologists. The spots where it becomes important to avail patients of an HCM expert are if the patient still is confused or has questions, uh, if, if you as the treating cardiologist aren't sure whether uh, the next therapy is appropriate or not for that patient, certainly anytime you're contemplating a, an ablation or a myectomy, that, that really should only be done by centers that have high volumes in this. There's, there's strong data now that show that the, that the outcomes, both success and mortality data, are much, much better uh, in those high volume centers. So, so that's important. And the other thing that kind of came out almost as a as a, a aha moment as we were putting together the final touches on the guidelines were if you're contemplating a 2B recommended diagnostic or therapeutic approach for your patient, that probably is a, a great trigger to say, maybe I should get one of the HCM centers to weigh in. And I say that because all of the 2B recommendations we had represented the bulk of the conversations we had because there's so many nuances, so many, so many things to consider in that space. And these were experts sitting around talking about it. And if your practice is not fully HCM, it's like a more general cardiology practice, it's going to be hard for you to, to be fully immersed in the nuances and emerging data in that regard. So so, so the idea again was that, that the HCM expert is part of the team that manages this a patient with HCM and the and the local cardiologist or the cardiologist who just happens to not work at an HCM center is a vital part of that team. And the person the patient's going to rely on day in and day out uh, should something go wrong. So, so it is very much a partnership and teamwork. 
And just to clarify for the audience, again, patients may want to know what are the 2B indications. And it says, I would read the guidelines. It pretty much boils down to your non-sustained ventricular tachycardia as a, as a lone uh, indication. Yeah. Yeah so, so, so yeah, so for the patients listening, when I say class 2B, so when we talk about the recommendations for either a diagnostic test or a therapy to, to give a patient, there's generally four levels of recommendations. Class 1 recommendations have the highest evidence that show that benefit greatly outweighs risk, and almost everyone would agree that the patient should get that therapy as a general rule. The next layer down is class 2A, where that therapy is considered reasonable. It might not be obligatory. It's not quite as strong a recommendation, but the bulk of evidence is in favor of doing that, that procedure or, 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 or test that we're, we're considering. 2B is, is the next layer down, and that is the role of that therapy is not ubiquitously understood to be exactly right for all patients in that category. So this is definitely where patient input, shared decision-making, and, and expert interpretation of maybe other nuances that you can't capture in that recommendation need to be considered. And then the lowest one is called class three, which means don't do that therapy. There's no reason to do it, or it might be detrimental to that patient. Right. So if you're at that class 2B level for sure, that's really where someone who understands the nuances of the disease, takes care of it day in, day out, really can, can help uh, the patient feel more confident in the decision they are making regarding their life. Right. Well, thank you for that. That was a very elegant uh, clarification of my question. So um, I also wanted to just uh, highlight the screening of adolescents because yeah. screening comes up every time, you know, we talk amongst ourselves or go give a conference, you know, even if you're just showing echoes of, yep. <laughs> of cardiomyopathy yep. patients, they want to, everyone wants to know what would you do for screening. So that was a change. And I just think maybe, I think you've made it more clear, but maybe you could just describe for the audience sure. what it is that we're looking for in the adolescent screening. Sure. So, so it really was a, a, a better articulation and, and more precise articulation of what the recommendations were. So in 2011, we had said that adult first degree relatives should be screened and that adolescents should be screened and that screening of children should start no later than the onset of puberty or age 12. And that got interpreted as saying screening shouldn't occur before age 12. And that's not really what it, it said. It said it can start any time, but no later than. So we made sure that was clear this time. And then we highlighted a few cases where you definitely want to start screening early. Uh, you know, in, even in single digit age children, young children, infants, and that is that that family has a particular, uh, had a lot of other early onset HCM in children, or if uh, sudden cardiac death was prominent in that family, and even if that family has a known HCM pathogenic variant, genetic pathogenic variant, that there is some data that those, those are going to be more clinically apparent uh, cases and maybe screen those people, those children earlier would be appropriate. In the absence of those things, you can still screen at a young age, but you can also wait a little bit in those individuals if, if the family wasn't inclined to do it. But again, you, you don't want to wait until they're in their mid-teens. You want to start screening when they really start that ra rapid growth phase of their life uh, at that point. Around puberty. Yeah. yeah, around puberty. Yeah. And so, and then obviously the screening options still exist. You can do a genetic testing protocol, whereas if the patient has a, an identified genetic variant, then you can use that variant to screen the family members. If we don't know the patient's genetic variant from one reason or another, then you're going to be using uh, echocardiography and electrocardiography to screen. For adult patients, that screening is every three to five years. For the kind of standard risk adolescent children, it's every two to three years. And for that subset of patients with the higher risk family profile, we would say every one to two years if you're doing the imaging screening protocols. Excellent. Well, I think you've done just an amazing job of, um, of going through these. I have one last question, and that would be around active, healthy lifestyle and athletes. You know, that also is one of those very kind of shared mm -hmm. decision-making uh, issues as well as some of the things have changed as we've get, gathered more data over the last, you know, couple of yeah. decade or so. So maybe you could help us understand that a little bit better. 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great discussion. So again, some of the basis for this comes out of the historic data that if you hear about a elite level athlete dying during training or, or competition, HCM is overrepresented as the underlying cause compared to HCM in the general population. And so there was this, this you know, longstanding recommendation that HCM patients not be allowed to participate in competitive sports that I think unfortunately even got boiled down to HCM patients shouldn't be allowed to exercise. And so then we ended up with a lot of HCM patients who were having all the other disease <laughs> sequelae of not being an active individual. Right. We now have data that show that the levels of low to moderate intensity exercise as part of a healthy lifestyle is beneficial to patients in HCM. Uh, just like it is for everyone else. There are actually studies ongoing now that include high intensity interval training. The, the data have been presented in abstract form and looks promising, but we haven't seen it in peer reviewed journals yet. So we're looking forward to see about the safety of that. But so we definitely want our patients to be able to be active uh, um, for all the health benefits of, of, of activity. The competitive athletics remains to be a, a vexing problem because I mean, the fact that HCM is overrepresented as a cause of death in those individuals means that the risk of being an athlete with, a, with HCM is higher risk than being an athlete without HCM. But it's difficult to quantify what that magnitude of risk is. When studies are focused just on patients with HCM, it's really hard to tell if, if being an HCM patient being an athlete is higher risk than being a non-athlete. Right. The data, the data kind of point in both directions. And so it implies that if there is an increase in risk among HCM patients for being athletic, the risk must be incremental, you know, a little bit higher, not tons higher, but to do a study to prove statistically that it's much, much higher would require a long study with more patients than are, than are currently athletes. Right. Uh, and so it's, so it's a challenging study to do. So the way we've addressed that in the guidelines is, again, to try to take the overly paternalistic, dogmatic, the answer is just no, and talk to the patients about it and say, if this individual wants to continue participating in competitive sports, you have to understand that there is evidence that the risk is higher and that we don't have a tool to, to assess how high that risk is for you. But if, you, if it's important to you and your family that you continue to participate in sports, then ultimately you, you can choose to do that. Mm -hmm. But you have to remember that each team, each college is going to have their own medical team and legal team that are also going to be making their assessment. And so you might not be able to choose the college or team on which you want to play, but you can choose to play. And if, and if there is a college or university or team that says, yes, we understand you have this medical condition, and as long as you understand what the risks are, we are willing to support you. That, so there's, there's three or more parties involved in these discussions. But the idea is we wanted to get away from just the dogmatic, no, you can't ever do this again, to yeah. being one that's more informative, uh, lets patients participate in that discussion. Now, obviously, there are patients who um, are, are going to have flags that are going to make us all uncomfortable. I mean, if they've had cardiac arrest in the past, yes. uh, you know, you know, it's going to be harder to you know, just say, oh, you can do what you choose. You're going to, you're going to as, a, as a doctor, uh, you know, convey your fears about the situation to the patient as well. Um, so so it's, it's a very nuanced discussion, and it, it's not just opening the barn door and letting every patient play competitive sports. But it's opening opening the doors so that we have a conversation about it r rather than just a quick answer. Yeah, no, I think that's a really uh, great discussion uh, that could take hours to, to discuss. Yep. And uh, you did a very nice job of summarizing it. And I think it also highlights here where uh, center that deals with this on a day-to-day -day basis, those comprehensive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy centers, they would probably have the best ability to carry these kind of very difficult discussions out with families uh, and patients. So, well, I don't know if there's, is there anything else uh, that's been, that was my list of questions for you. Do you have any other things that you'd like to highlight before we? Uh... Yeah, I, th I think the only other thing that I would add, Kyle, is just specifically re-highlighting that for patients with HCM who develop atrial fibrillation, oh, yes. that having HCM is equivalent of having a CHADS VAS score of three. So we don't even use the CHADS VAS score. So patients who have a substantial burden of atrial fibrillation uh, 
anticoagulation with either warfarin or the DOAX is a class one recommendation. And so, to, you know, make, make sure that we're protecting our patients from, from stroke if they do develop atrial fibrillation. No, that's, that's a very important point. And, and really the CHADS2 VAS uh, score could be another topic of one of these sessions, which we yeah. might want to come back to at a later date because it really is a narrow group of patients that it really applies to. So yeah. we won't go there today. Okay. But it's been incredibly informative and very uh, helpful, I think, to patients and clinicians that are dealing with this, uh, what we used to think was a rare disease, which no longer is really a rare disease, as we know that at least one in 500 and possibly more and mm -hmm. population studies have this uh, entity called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So Steve, uh, on behalf of uh, the, ask, uh, the, the, the interview with the experts uh, teams, as well as all of our patients and clinicians, and the ACC, I think, has benefited greatly from your expertise. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Kyle.